Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So tonight we're going to start talking about two characters in the time of the Buddha. And um, we are still working with the Buddha and his teachings. Narada's book, The Buddha and His Teachings. And this one, um, this is really fun because this one is Devadatta. And this is the Buddha's chief opponents and supporters, okay? So we're going to do one of each tonight. As a solid rock is not shaken by the wind, even so the wise are not ruffled by praise or blame. This is the opening. Now the Dhammapada is talked about briefly in the front. The Buddha worked constructively and operationally for the wheel of mankind, making no distinction between the rich or the poor when he taught the high and the low. The followers and supporters were drawn both from the highest and the lowest rungs of the social ladder. So spontaneous was the love and so profound was the veneration of the people that kings and nobles, millionaires and paupers, pious folk and courtesans, men and women of all ranks, they vied with one another to be of service to him and to make his noble mission a success. Now the wealthy, they spent lavishly to erect suitable monasteries for him, while the poor, full of faith, demonstrated their piety in their own humble way. With perfect equanimity, he accepted the gifts of the rich and the poor, but showed no partiality to any. And nevertheless, he showed more compassion to the poor and the lowly. Like a bee that extracts honey from a flower without hurting the flower, he lived amongst his followers and supporters without causing the slightest inconvenience for any. Offerings of diverse kinds were showered upon him and he accepted them all with perfect non-attachment. And though absolutely pure in motive and perfectly selfless in his service to humanity, yet in preaching and spreading his teachings, the Dhamma and the Buddha had to contend against strong opposition. He was severely criticized, roundly abused, insulted and ruthlessly attacked as no other religious teacher had been. His opponents were ordinary teachers of rival sects and followers of heretic, heretical schools whose traditional teachings and superstitious rites and ceremonies he justly criticized. Now his great personal enemy who made a vain attempt to kill him was his own brother-in-law and an erstwhile disciple named Devadatta. The Buddha and Devadatta. Now Devadatta was the son of King Supabuddha and Pamita, an aunt of the Buddha. Yasodhara was his sister. 
he was thus a cousin and brother-in-law of the Buddha. He entered the order in the early part of the Buddhist ministry, together with Ananda and other Sakya princes. He could not attain any of the stages of sainthood, but he was distinguished for worldly psychic powers. One of his chief supporters was King Ajatasattu, who built a monastery for him. During the early part of his career, he led such an exemplary life that even Venerable Sariputta went about Rajagaha extolling him. Later, overcome by worldly gain and honor and growing jealous of the Buddha, Devadatta became a radically changed person in his character, so much so that he proved to be the greatest personal enemy of the Buddha. Simultaneous with the arising of ill will in his heart towards the Buddha, his psychic powers automatically ceased. Despite his evil ways and corrupt life, he had a large following and many admirers, and some even preferred him to the venerable Sariputta. Now, on one occasion, he approached the Buddha and he requested him to hand over the leadership of the Sangha to him as the Buddha had advanced in age. The Buddha straightway refused, saying, not even to Sariputta or Moggallana will I hand over the Sangha. Would I then hand it over to thee? He was enraged at this refusal and vowed his vengeance. To safeguard and maintain the dignity of the Sangha, the Buddha caused a proclamation to be made that Devadatta alone was responsible for anything done to him. In the name of the Buddha, the Dhamma or the Sangha. He therefore conspired with King Ajatasattu to kill the Buddha. Ajatasattu was advised to kill his father and usurp his throne, which is another story, while he himself decided to kill the Buddha and lead the Sangha. Ungrateful, Ajatasattu succeeded in killing his devout father and Devadatta hired bowmen to murder the Buddha, but contrary to his expectations, all the hirelings became the Buddha's followers. Foiled in his attempt, he himself resolved to kill the Buddha. When the Buddha was walking on the slopes of Jija Kuta, he climbed the peak and mercilessly hurled a rock at the Buddha. Now, fortunately, it struck another piece of rock and a splinter slightly wounded his foot, causing the blood to flow, but did not kill him. Jivaka, the physician, attended to the Buddha and cured him. Devadatta made another unsuccessful attempt to kill the Buddha by dispatching the elephant Nalagiri after infuriating him with liquor against the teacher. And when the ferocious elephant approached the Buddha and Venerable Ananda stepped forward to sacrifice his life for the sake of the master. But the Buddha subdued the beast by sending loving kindness towards him and the beast stopped. 
By this last wicked act, Devadatta became extremely unpopular and public opinion was so much against him that the king was compelled to withdraw his patronage. Devadatta then fell into disrepute and all his favors decreased. He now decided to live by deceit. His fertile brain devised another seemingly peaceful plan with the help of equally evil-minded bhikkhus like Kokalika. He thought of causing a schism in the order. He requested the Buddha to enforce the following five rules amongst the bhikkhus. Number one, all monks should dwell all their lives in the forest. Number two, that they should live on alms that they begged for. Number three, that they should wear homsakula robes, robes made from the rags that were collected from the dust heap and from the cemeteries. Number four, that they should live at the foot of a tree. And number five, that they should not eat fish or flesh throughout their entire lifetime. This he did knowing fully well that the Buddha would not assent to this. He desired to make the Buddha's refusal his pretext for disparaging the Buddha and thereby winning the support of the ignorant masses. But when this request was made, the compassionate and tolerant Buddha declared that his disciples were free to adopt these rules or not, but would not make them compulsory for all his monks. Devadatta made this refusal a cause for a schism in the order. He appealed to the bhikkhus saying, brethren, whose words are the nobler, the words of the Tathagata or the words which I myself have uttered? Whoever desires release from suffering, let him come over with me. Now newly ordained monks who were not conversant with the Dhamma apparently approved of his demands and went over to him. Accompanied by them, he went to Gaya Sisa. But Venerable Sariputta and Moggallana, on the advice of the Buddha, they went there and succeeded in winning them back after explaining the Dhamma to them. Now, thereafter that event, evil days fell upon Devadatta. He fell grievously ill, and before his death, he sincerely repented and desired to see the Buddha. But his bad karma interfered, and he had to die a miserable death alone without seeing the Buddha. However, he sought refuge in the Buddha at the last moment. Although he suffers in a woeful state for his heinous crimes, yet as a result of the holy life he led during the early part of his career, it was stated that he would become a Pajika Buddha named At Atisara in the distant future. There ends the story of Devadatta. So that was an opponent to be reckoned with. And he did it well in a kindly way as much as he could, but he did not become a doormat for the person who was coming after him, which is something I said once to some people. The Buddha doesn't say we should come to be a doormat for someone just to walk over and do what they like. It's not correct. Now we go to Anatha Pindika. 
Anatta Pindika. The chief supporter of the Buddha was Anatta Pindika, the millionaire. Amongst his lay followers, he was regarded as the foremost alms giver or dayaka. The original name of Anatta Pindika, which means the feeder of the helpless, was Sudatta. Owing to his unparalleled generosity, he was later known by his new name. His birthplace was in Sawati. Now one day he visited his brother-in-law in Rajagaha to transact some business. He did not come forward as usual to welcome him, but Sudatta found him in the backyard making preparations for a large feast. On inquiry, to his indescribable joy, he understood that those arrangements were being made to entertain the Buddha on the following day. Now the utterance of the mere word Buddha roused his interest and he longed to see him. As he was told that the Buddha was living in the Sitavana forest in the neighborhood and that he could see him on the following morning, he went to sleep. Now his desire to visit the Buddha was so intense that he had a sleepless night and he arose at an unusual hour in the morning to start for the Sitavana. It appears that owing to his great faith in the Buddha, a light emanated from his body. He proceeded to the spot passing through a cemetery. It was pitch dark and fear arose in him. He thought of turning back. And then Sivaka, Ayaka, himself invisible, encouraged him and said to him, a hundred elephants and horses too. I uh, and a hundred chariots drawn by mules. I and a hundred thousand maidens in their ears bejeweled with rings. All are not worth the 16th fraction of a single stride you make. Advance, O citizen, go forward thou now. Advance for thee is better than retreat. His fear vanished and faith in the Buddha arose in its place. Light appeared again and he courageously sped forward. Nevertheless, all this happened a second time and yet a third time, but ultimately he reached Siddhavana where the Buddha was pacing up and down in the open air, anticipating his visit. The Buddha, addressed him by his family name, Sudatta, and called him to his presence. Nathapindika was pleased to hear the Buddha address him thus, and respectfully inquired whether the Buddha rested happily. And the Buddha replied, surely at all times happily doth rest the Arahat, in whom all fires are extinct who cleaveth not to sensuous desires, cool all his being, rid of all the germs that bring new life, all cumbrances cut out, subdued the pain and pining of the heart, calm and serene he resteth happily, for in his mind he hath attained peace. And hearing the Dhamma, he became a Sotapanna, stream winner, and invited the Buddha to spend the rainy season at Sawati. The Buddha accepted the invitation, suggesting that Buddhas take pleasure in solitude. Another Pindika, returning to Sawati, bought the park belonging to Prince Jetta at a price determined by covering, so the story goes, the whole site 
with gold coins and erected the famous Jetavana Monastery at a great cost. And here the Buddha spent 19 of his rainy seasons. This monastery where the Buddha spent the major part of his life was the place where he delivered many, many of his sermons. Several discourses, <coughs> which were of particular interest to laymen, were delivered to Anathapindika. Although he refrained from asking any questions of the Buddha, lest he should weary him, and once the Buddha discoursing on generosity reminded Anathapindika that almsgiving to the order of the monks together with the Buddha is very meritorious. But more meritorious than such an alms is the building of a monastery for the use of the order. And more meritorious than such a monastery is seeking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and more meritorious than seeking the refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha is the observance of the five precepts. More meritorious than such observance is meditation on loving kindness, metta, for a moment, one moment, and most meritorious of all is the development of insight as to the fleeting nature of everything. We pass the eye. It is evident from this discourse that generosity is the first stage on the way of Buddhist life. More important than generosity is the observance of at least the five rules of regulated behavior, which tend to the disciplining of words and deeds. And still more important and more beneficial is the cultivation of such ennobling virtues like loving kindness, which lead to self-development. Most important and more beneficial of all Self-discipline in a sincere effort to understand things as they truly are. Commenting on the four kinds of bliss a layman may enjoy, the Buddha declared this. There are these four kinds of bliss to be won by the householder who enjoys the pleasures of sense from time to time and when occasion offers, the bliss of ownership, atisukha, the bliss of wealth, bhoga sutta, the bliss of deathlessness, enana sukha, and the bliss of blamelessness, anavaj jasukha. What is the bliss of ownership? Herein, a clansman has wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by strength of arm, won by sweat, lawful and lawfully gotten. At the thought, wealth is mine, acquired by energetic striving, lawfully gotten, bliss will come to him satisfaction comes to him. And this is called the bliss of ownership. And what is the bliss of wealth? Herein, a clansman, by means of wealth acquired by energetic striving, both enjoys his wealth and does meritorious deeds therewith. And at the thought, of means of wealth acquired, I both enjoy my wealth and do meritorious deeds. Bliss comes to him, satisfaction comes to him, and this is called the bliss of wealth. What is the bliss, the bliss of 
debtlessness. Herein, a clansman owes no debt, great or small, to anyone. And at the thought, I owe no debt, great or small, to anyone, bliss comes to him. Satisfaction comes to him. And this is called the bliss of debtlessness. And what is the bliss of blamelessness? Herein, the Aryan disciple is blessed with blameless action of body, blameless action of speech, blameless action of mind. And at the thought, I am blessed with blameless action of body, speech, and mind. Bliss comes to him. Satisfaction comes to him. And this is called the bliss of blamelessness, winning the bliss of debtlessness, a man may then recall the bliss of really having. And when he enjoys the bliss of wealth, he sees tis such by wisdom. And when he sees, he knows thus, this is he that he is indeed in both respects. But these have not one sixteenth of the bliss that cometh to a man of blamelessness. On another occasion, when the Buddha visited the house of Anathapindika, he heard an unusual uproar in the house and inquired, what is, what is that? What was it? And Lord, it is Sujata, my daughter-in-law, who lives with us. She is rich and has been brought here from a wealthy family. She pays no heed to her mother-in-law, nor to her father-in-law, nor to her husband, nor does she venerate honor, reverence, nor respect the exalted one, replied Anathapindika. The Buddha called her to his presence and preached an illuminative discourse on seven kinds of wives that exist even today in modern society, just as it was in the days of old. First, whoso is wicked in mind, ill-disposed, pitiless, fond of other men, neglecting husband, a prostitute and bent on harassing, such a one is called a troublesome wife. But haka bariya is the expression. Whoso wishes to squander whatever profits, though little that the husband gains, whether by crafts or trade or plow, such a one is called a thievish wife. The Kori Bariya. Whoso is not inclined to do anything, lazy, glutinous, harsh, cruel, fond of bad speech, lives domineering the industrious person, and such a one is called a lordly wife. Ayabariya. Whoso is ever kind and compassionate, protects her husband like a mother, her son, guards the accumulated wealth of her husband, such a one is called a motherly wife, matu bariya. Whoso is respected towards her husband, just as a younger sister towards her elder brother, modest, lives in accordance with her husband's wishes, such a one is called a sisterly wife. Bagini Bariya. Whoso rejoices at the sight of her husband, even as a friend on seeing a companion who has come after a long time, is of noble birth, virtuous and chaste, such a one is called a friendly wife, Sakibaria. Whoso, when threatened with harm and punishment, is not angry but is calm, 
endures all things of her husband with no wicked heart, free from hatred, lives in accordance with her husband's wishes. Such a one is called a handmaid wife. Dasi Bharya. The Buddha, describing the characteristics of the seven kinds of wives, remarked that of them, the troublesome wife, Divadhaka, Bharya, the thievish wife, Kura Bharya, the lordly wife, Aya Bharya, are bad and undesirable ones, while the motherly wife, Matu Bharya, sisterly wife, Bagini Bharya, friendly wife, Saki Bharya, and handmaid wife, Dasi Bharya, are good and praiseworthy ones. Thus, Sujata, are the seven kinds of wives a man may have. And which of them are you? Lord, let the exalted one think of me as a handmaid wife. Dasi Bharya, from this day forth I shall be. Anatha Pindika used to visit the Buddha daily. And finding that people go disappointed in the absence of the Buddha, wished to know from the Venerable Ananda where there was a possibility for the devout followers to pay their respects when the Buddha goes out on his preaching tours. Now, this matter was re reported to the Buddha with the result that the Ananda Bodhi tree which stands to this day was planted at the entrance to the monastery. Punya Lakhana, a very virtuous lady, was his wife. Maha Subhada, Kuta Subhada, and Sumana were his three devout daughters. The elder two had attained Sotapati, while the youngest was a Sakadagami, his only son Kala, who was at first irreligious, later became a Sotapana by the skillfulness of his father. Anathapindika breathed his last after hearing a profound discourse from Venerable Sariputta. As he was about to die, he sent a messenger to inform the Buddha that he was seriously ill and that he paid his homage to him. And then to request the Venerable Sariputta to have compassion on him and visit him in his house. Then as invited, the Venerable Sariputta accompanied by Venerable Ananda, they proceeded to his house and inquired about his health. He replied that he was suffering greatly from an acute pain and that he was seeing no signs of progress. The Venerable Sariputta then preached a profound discourse. Tears came to his eyes at the close of this sermon. Venerable Ananda, seeing him in tears, asked him whether he was sinking Anathapindika answered, not at all, venerable sir, though I have long attended on the master and his disciples, never did I hear such a discourse. Such profound discourses are not always taught to the white robed layman as they cannot comprehend their meanings, but are reserved for advanced disciples, replied the venerable Sariputta. But Anathapindika begged Venerable Sariputta to expound such intricate dhamma to the laity as well, for there would be some who could understand it, who did not have any blockage to understanding this. No longer before the departure, not long, of these two great disciples, Anathapindika passed away and was immediately reborn into the Tusita heaven. And at night, 
Deva Anathapindika, illuminating the whole of Jetta Grove, came up to the Buddha, saluted him, and extolling the virtues of Venerable Sariputta, he expressed his pleasure on seeing the Buddha and his disciples that were residing in his monastery. And he said to them, goodwill and wisdom, mind by method trained, the highest conduct on good morals based, this maketh mortals pure, not rank, nor wealth. And that was his last words. So these are two characters really that have done so much in the stories of the Buddha. And at the Pindika especially, I have often told my students was sort of like a roadie for the concerts that people go to today. I don't know if you've ever gone to a big concert, outdoor concert or something, but there's always the manager of the roadies. And the roadies are the people who follow the musicians across the country when they're in the tour for each concert that is set up. And they're the ones that set everything up so that the musicians are safe when they perform on the stage and no one can get hurt at the concert by any of the equipment or anything. But they're always so busy during the concerts, they have to wait for the record album to come out, to listen to the music, because they were so busy, they, they couldn't pay attention to what was really happening in the show. And that Papindika was like that. He was talking about something that actually had been mentioned in many, many lessons to the people in various ways. But the fact is he was the one responsible for people setting up for the Buddha and 500 monks or whoever else was coming for the food that was being served at various houses. He was the one that was going ahead of the crew and setting everything up. He didn't have time to actually listen wholeheartedly to many of the, of the lessons the Buddha taught. He was there. It mentions he was there, but he wasn't right on cue to listen to everything the Buddha was saying because of all the things that were needed. So I want to hear from you now what you thought about these two characters and if you have any questions. Hey, you, how are you? I'm, as you can see, I'm outside at the moment. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I, I was particularly struck with uh, David Data, the, uh, the power of his former behavior still coming through in spite of the uh, degree of his transgression against the Buddha. Um, and does the, do the uh, accounts describe um, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes in the uh, Jataka tales, uh, they talk about past karma and his past. Um, uh, you know, because his past must have been very blessed to become in contact with the Buddha, um, but then also to have this uh, this this particularly transgressive behaviour. Um, so. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is I'm asking, other than is there more information about David? Well, you can find more information in a couple places. There um, are some other books about the disciples and the people that were with him. Besides this one, Narada's done a really good job with this, but there are some other things mm. also. Um, but you know, Devudatta had an early really serious incident with the Buddha concerning the swan. I don't know if you remember that. No, but I'm not familiar with that. No. When he was very, when they were young, they were playing together at the, um, often playing together, you know? And um, 
what happened was uh, the Buddha was outside and Devadatta, they, they both were doing archery, but Devadatta, he shot a swan and the swan fell down, but it was alive and it fell down near to where the Buddha was, closer to him than Devadatta. So the Buddha picked it up and Devadatta was really, really mad. This is my swan. I get to kill it. And he said, well, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm not going to kill it. I'm going to save it. And then they called the priest, the family priest, and had him come uh, to talk to him about uh, what it was. And he decided, yes, the swan belonged to the to um, Siddhartha. It did not belong to Devadatta. And he kept it and healed the swan. It was a beautiful story. And it probably stuck with him his whole life because he didn't win. <laughs> and he shot the swan down. He was seriously, seriously angry, you know. And this, it carries on in his life. And um, of course, you know, amongst the um, monastics, when you look at the whole setup of the thing, you know, somebody's going to come out of the woodwork. And there was discord sometimes with um, a monk who had particularly had come to become a monk with the Buddha, but then got, got infuriated that he was given the rules and he had to follow them. They came to take shelter to live here, but I didn't come here to follow your rules. There's too many rules. You're telling us what to do with everything. We don't want to, that's ridiculous. And he would end up quitting and going away. It's a few situations where that happened. And um, everybody kind of knew that with that, that, that existed amongst monks, still does, it still does today. Why did you come to become a monk? Why are you here? What are you going to do? Uh, that's a still an issue, of course, because you decide to come. Um, a lot of times people don't check and you might owe money and you come to escape that or something. There's not, it's not a lot of regulation as so much now as there was. But you see, the thing was um, that, um, somebody was going to surface and do the sort of thing he did near when he was, this is happening when the Buddha was very old, you know, the part about where he tried to kill him and stuff. And Ajiva Sattu was no, he was no help as an influence to him when he teamed up with him, the one king, because he had murdered his father, you see. And it's a very sad story about that, where uh, he, he had locked, he gotten sick of waiting for the throne, so he locked his father in a dungeon. And then uh, the story goes, he sort of forgot about him and just left him there. And then he started to feel guilty and he wanted to go and save him. So he went back down there to save him and he found him dead in the cell. And then he was caught with this really bad thing he had done by killing his father, really bad situation. You know, and then um, he became uh, pretty bad after that. So this, he latched on to Devadatta's attitude and teamed up with him to make trouble. I think the funniest part of the story is when they took all that money in one account and hired all those people to go and kill the Buddha. And there were two different groups that were sent to kill the Buddha. And neither of those groups came back to the two of them because they went there and the Buddha you know, it is a tamer of men to be tamed, and he tamed them, and they all became Buddhists, and some of them became monks. So, <laughs> I thought that, that was also that, that also echoes uh, when uh, the Buddha's father sent out uh, the courtiers to to invite the Buddha to come back, and they didn't return, but they ordained. That's when his father probably began to suspect what was happening and got more information and found out what was really going on. His father, yeah. you know, was real discouraged about that. But at the same time, uh, he wasn't really viciously angry or anything like that. No, because no. he was no, no, proud no, no, of the no, fact no. that he no. had become a Buddha. And he knew from the start he could be one or the other, the ruler, a great ruler, world ruler, or he could be uh, become a Buddha and tried to protect him, tried to keep him inside, but couldn't succeed at doing that. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing that struck me was um, the fact that he was such a close relation and that they shared a childhood. And 
this kind of kind of suggests to me that some of the most potent um, uh, mechanisms that we work with are uh, within the family, the family dynamic, and uh, and how that uh, um, brings out. Uh, uh, well, we could call it sibling rivalry, but this is much greater than that. Uh, uh, it, it kind of brings out into relief all of the uh, the challenges and the assumptions and the reflexes um, uh, that we feel, and that we can either see this as a burden or we can see this as a um, something helpful to us to. Um, uh, to reflect on and and recognize within ourselves and within other members of a, of a family. Yeah, if a person has uh, had, you know, if the person picks up the training, a lot of things, for instance, that are happening, can be looked at and gotten through in life. In not. It's not a good way, sort of, but it's an it's an educative way instead of going through all the sorrow and lamentation and pain and grief and despair of what happened. I mean, our neighbor here, right next to where I'm located, their apartment burned out at night. The electrical mm. system went bad and it, there was a fire and, but they all got out. She, she came over here. We had been, it was interesting because we had been given a lot of stuff and we don't have almost any space. And so, she really, you know, we gave her a whole bundle of stuff that we, we couldn't keep, you know, that we didn't, we had been given a uh, new town and I, but we had, we have no place to store stuff, no closet and had some things in boxes. And so we supplied them with some things uh, when she came, but she was in tears and I, I spat her in front of me and I said, listen now to me, you have to listen to me. And she looked at me and I said, you've been given a great gift. It doesn't sound like you've been given a good gift, but in a way now you have a chance to really look at what you have and what is the most valuable thing in your family. Everybody got out of that apartment. The children didn't get hurt and you and your husband and your father didn't, didn't get burned or hurt. You got out. And so it doesn't matter. And she was a person very beautiful and she very, very, very tiny and very beautiful. And she had many, many beautiful saris she would wear walking up and down the street and stuff. She loved her saris. They were all gone. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, now's the time uh, to, to see what has actually happened is this lesson. And I told her the story about, um, you know, um, the mustard seed and how everything is impermanent. And she looked at me with big eyes and said, that's almost like my story. I said, yeah, and this is your lesson. It's a chance for you to see now how craving will work and will get you really upset. You don't have this, you don't have that, you don't like this, you don't like that, or you're going to be okay and go through this with a steady, a steady mind and just um, play it through the whole thing. And she got it, she really got it. It was fun to tell oh, her. That's, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So everybody on the street gave them as much as they could to, and it's a poor community, but everybody had something to give her to help her to be able to stay until they could come and eventually pay for, um, you know, doing the electrical system over again in the apartment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're just so lucky, though. They're so lucky. <laughs> They're so lucky. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have um, a, a one of my one of my uh, clients. Um, she lost her mother to COVID out in uh, Malaysia, and she's really really struggling um with uh the degree of her um attachment and the sort of incapacity and grief uh that she feels and the huge longing um to uh see her mother again and uh i was going to ask you you know eh, 
what what would be your approach to um, uh, assist her in seeing uh, that uh, uh, this overwhelming feeling, A, of course, comes from herself, uh, yeah. but B, to honour mm. the memory uh, without being completely incapacitated? Grief, first of all, before you teach a person about grief, you have to teach them a balancing lesson. So you get 131 out and you look at it very carefully and you use the Buddha Rikata Sutta to teach the person in a way where you're asking them questions. You are not just teaching her about it because she, you know, if you just teach somebody about the past, the future, and the present, they think you're an idiot. Of course, we know those words. Everybody knows yeah, those yeah, words. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. If, you, if you begin to get into the nitty gritty of what the past is and what the future is and what the present time is and teach them the lesson of the value of living in a present time capsule that is moving forward and that you're actually giving them an arahat lesson, giving them a lesson how to stay with nothing but the present time and move forward and not pay any attention to anything that's in the past or the future. But that's easier than said, said than done when someone has died that's close to you. But the second mm. lesson comes then. The second lesson is what is grief? And you have to get out your little paper and you know pen and show them a picture of how it happens that the six sense doors work through contact and and then a feeling comes up. In her case, what the problem is, is mind. Mind has a thought arise and makes contact with mind consciousness, the yeah. mind and the mind con and the mind object. And then this thought brings a painful feeling. And that's the second lesson she needs to learn is how this operates. It's a three-step lesson, okay? And then they learn that the painful feeling, I don't like this feeling and it's, and then they have to watch it. They have to want to discover how does the human being work? How does this grief work? How does it come up? How does the pain overrun me? And how does it take over? And it's happening where she'll begin to see the past butts in and comes in and gets involved in this, you see. And then when I don't like something, my mind just goes because it hurts and I loved her so much and I want her back and I want her back now in this, but that's the Anicca. And you point out, this is the Anicca now biting you. The Anicca is everything is impermanent. All of us in the first lesson are born to die. You start to die after you're born. <laughs> You start to move to die after you're born. And by the time you're eight years old, you have a full body that's going to rotate every seven years. I believe you'll have a fully new body again until a certain age you get to, which I can tell you about. <laughs> and then it starts to deteriorate and you don't get a second, another run on your knees and you have to replace your knees. This is what will happen and things like that. Okay. But then the last lesson, after you get through this lesson of how this is working, you it's choosing the perspective to examine, the idea to examine what is grief, not all, just how is it operating, but why does it happen? Not that part, but why am I overrun? Um, grief, theoretically, they put a time thing on it in psychology of, you know, it could go for a week or two, or it could go for three, three months or it could go for three years. And three years is about where some of the writers say, well, that should be the end of it at three years. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing about grief is to understand what this imperfection, which is, it's, it's something that takes over your life. It's an imperfection in the fact that it's a hindrance and it stops you from things if you don't understand what to do with it. But if you are studying this object, this grief, this thing, and finding out how it works, you begin to understand it works the same way as bone cancer. It really isn't any different. In bone cancer, uh, you it's a tremendously painful thing or in, um, destructive rheumatoid arthritis where the hands are all completely knotted and can't move anymore if we dwell on it and we feed it dis discouragement and we're disgusted with it and we're angry at it, it just gets tighter and it hurts all that much more but we taught a woman once 
in California, how to send loving kindness to the body and loving kindness and forgiveness to the body and thank the body for carrying me through life and thank you for everything that you've done for me and I'll do the best I can to take care of you. Now that I've got pain, what do I do? Well, in the case of bone cancer, um, what we do is take the young patient or the old patient and teach them how to watch the cycle of this pain. And the cycle of bone, bone uh, cancer, internal bone cancer is very painful, but it comes and then when it comes, it rises and it's there and it might be one like this, you see, and then it's there and then it fades. When it comes again, it'll have an interval and it'll come. Once you find that interval or see how it's happening, then you can go on with your life with that underneath. But when that's there and it frightens you, it can drive you into other types of psychological diagnoses from that, such as going into depression, going into panic attacks, not wanting to see other people in the family who might die. Of course, everybody's dying. Bonte tells the story of going to the hospital to see a man who was terminally ill. And when he got there, he sort of was like the story of... Um, the, um, I forget the name of that movie uh, where the guy went in with the, the clown nose. He went in to the, nobody, oh, yes. yeah, that, you, know, yeah. you know the one I mean. And he stood yes, in front of that man. He says, what are you doing in my room? I told nobody to come in here. I'm dying. Did you hear? My wife can't come in. My children can't come in. Nobody should come in my room. You get out of here. He says, no, I'm not leaving. Well, what do you think you're doing? And then he stopped. Started, he started to recite a research he had in the bucket he had. He had a little bucket with him. Inside the bucket was a piece of paper. And uh, he, he recited, it was Robin Williams played the part of the doctor. And he's standing there with this red thing on his nose like a clown. And he starts reading all the words that mean you die. End of the road. Kick the bucket. Over the hill. In the ground. And he kept doing this. He was reciting hundreds and hundreds of them. And at first the guy was sitting there like, get out of my room. You know, I don't want to hear this. And then he's, he would get to about a hundred of them. It was a great scene. You should look it up. It's just a great scene. And then the guy started laughing and he couldn't stop laughing. And then, the, then Robin Williams says to him, you know, I'm dying too. And that's what Bonte said when he went to see this man. He said, you need to let the family in. He said, why? He said, because, you know, I just got off the plane and I came to tell you I'm dying too. Everybody is dying. It's not like we're not going to die. And so it's like, wake up and get in your bubble and stay in the present time and go along and don't let anything in from the past or anything in from the future. Just label them and laugh at them, let them go until later if you want to look at them fine but don't take them personally because they're okay. past and the energy's gone and the energy you have in your life right now is right here the other thing with the person when the person dies especially a close person it's not a bad line to say do you really think that person wants you to do this with their life yeah don't yes indeed they want you did they love you oh he loved me so much he loved me so well then don't you think that he wants you to live out your life and be happy that's an important Indeed. lesson here mm. you know mm. he doesn't want you to or she doesn't want you to um waste your life that's it they they worked for you as a, a companion in your life wanting the best for you as a friend or as a mate as a father as a mother or a child and when this happens you have to think for a minute. And then the other thing I tell people, when someone is dying, you be sure to get them that family, you get them and you buy them a box, you know, a big scrapbook and you buy them a, a shoe box and a scrapbook and some pens and you take them and you give it to them while the person is still conscious and they can still be talking to the person about the memories about, the way they want to remember that person and to do it with the person is just magical. If you do it before they die, doing it afterwards, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's something they can do to get their mind 
off where they were going with the grief and everything. But the big one I found is when you give it to the, the person who's terminally ill and their father and they do it together. That was the first one I ever handled was Tim and Marie. And he was a divorcee with a 14 year old daughter with a tumor in the back of her head that was inoperable the size of a tennis ball. And she was dying the year of her prom, her junior prom in, in Belgium. And we had no money at the center. At that time, we had no supporters. And he would call and say, she really wants you to come and see her. And I would talk to her on the phone and then I would talk to him. But what they did was miraculous because she had a friend buy him a white cowboy hat. And, um, and he had a friend buy her a prom dress. And um, they worked together on this scrapbook and invited everybody, including her mother, who would come over every once in a while with a box full of pictures and say, here's some pictures, let's do this too. And all these pictures went in the scrapbook together, you see, for about her before she passed away. But the night of her prom, everybody came to see her and give her something from the prom. And then he, he took her in, picked her up and carried her in the other room where he lit up the whole room with candles and they danced and he had her in his arms and danced with her and they were, it was just broke. He just broke your heart to know what was going on. Cause about three days later, she passed away in the night and went to sleep and, and died. But he was her, her knight in shining armor. And she said, the cowboy is had is the best I can do. <laughs> They had lots of jokes, lots of stories, shared all their music from him when he was growing up and her music and her friends came and they didn't believe her that she was so together about keeping them together because she was dying, which is not unusual for between nine and 14 years old for the child to be totally grounded that he's they're dying yeah. and the parents are held together by this child saying, look, this isn't that bad. I mean, I've been here and let's talk, let's celebrate. And, and the, I, I, the first time I ran into that was in Texas and, um, uh, in San Antonio in the hospital, military hospital in San Antonio, where I worked with the terminally ill children for a little while. And one boy, I, you would ask them at that time, I was not Buddhist, but at that time, I really remember so clearly this boy who was dying, but he had one wish. And this is before the wish thing started in the United States. And all he wanted was to be able to shoot the rapids in a canoe. That's all he wanted. Mm -hmm. I said, and I went, I, I can do that. I can do that for him. And the doctor said, well, then let's go. And so we got a huge Ge National Geographic picture, you know, film and put it in the room at the foot of the bed and sat him up and let him shoot the rapids. And he was thrilled, thrilled absolutely thrilled that he got to shoot the rapids down this big river and with a camera right in the front of the boat, just going down. Yeah you know, size four to six rapids. These are really big. And watching them do all this stuff in the boat, he just was so thrilled, you know. These are things, there's little things you can do for people to help them that go through this. Okay. Yeah. And just to remind me again, uh, the Sutter reference was uh, 131, was it? I'm sorry, what was it? The, the Sutter reference was 131, was it? Uh, this, the, the Sutta I'm talking to you about obviously was of great value for us to keep and use forever. It is the only sutta in the Majima Nikai that's in there four times in a row. 131, 132, 133, and 134. And, uh, and, and the, uh, what it is is the, um, what touched me, I was in, yeah, I was in Sri Lanka talking to an elder monk and he said, um, I said, what was it like? And he said, well, what did you learn that you took to the villages? What did you learn? And he said, well, the one thing all of us had to learn when we were young monks, we had to memorize um, the um, prose in the sutta. And you can teach people, I was telling someone the other day, just the first set, first of four lines, let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hope. For the past has been left behind, 
and the future has not been reached. That is the reality, the, the way things actually are, see? Yeah. And just doing it that much. And then if you go further, if you have the meditator, you say, instead, with insight, let him see, let him know, uh, see, let him see each presently arisen state let him know that and be sure of it invincibly and unshakably. And then the rest of it is sort of uh, giving you an excuse of why you need to teach that. <laughs> the rest of it goes, um, today the effort must be made, tomorrow death may come, who knows, okay? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away, but one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly by day and by night. It is he that the peaceful sage has said, who will have a single excellent night. It's called the single excellent night. And it's, yeah. it's taught once purely, and then Ananda and the single excellent night is the second one, and then Maha Kachana and the single excellent night is the next one. And the last one is um, Lom Lomasakanjia. Lomasakanjia was uh, one of the lay people and a single excellent night. So they're very short. You, you can learn the whole little sutta, it's only three pages, not even three pages. It's like what the first one's almost two pages, two and a half pages. But these things were taught to the villagers to memorize and help them to memorize those phrases so they could remember, leave the past alone, leave the future alone, be here, you do your work each day in the present time. And then you go home and you hang up your day. I always tell people you hang up your day on the door when you walk in and then you go in the house. It's just make up. You pretend you're taking today off and hang it on the hook and then go inside. <laughs> no matter what happens. <laughs> I, uh, if, if other people have questions, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Yeah. If there, if there are other questions, I can't. Uh, if there are any questions, I still have a question about uh, Have you got it? I don't. What is it, Don I can't hear it. Uh, it must be uh, this thing. Uh, uh, there, there, sh there could be a problem with the uh, connection. There's a problem a little bit with the connection. Okay. Yeah. My connection is so, also wrong. Can you hear me better now? Yes. 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 Okay. So, um, People have got some questions about what you've just uh, been presenting today, um, but I'd like, love to hear those. Uh, if not, I have a question about uh, what you were teaching on uh, Sunday. So, um, uh, if you have time to answer that. I can't. I'm missing it. You need to get it right in front of your face. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yes. No? Yeah. Um, yes. I have a question about Sunday presentation which I listened to because I couldn't attend but I don't want to ask that question if others have questions about what you've done today. On Sunday what we did? Last Sunday? Last Sunday yes. What did I do last Sunday? Oh okay last Sunday was talking about, about clinging. Clinging right. We about clinging. Right. Yeah. We were talking about clinging and the clinging is a holding on, but meaning grasping something, but it isn't just the grasping, it is the generation, that link is the generation of mental proliferation. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I was interested. Yeah. I was interested in the fact that it talked about uh, feeling and perception and then mental proliferation and didn't have an emphasis on uh, craving. Um, it's whistling. I, I can't. I can't understand it. I can't understand you. I think it is a basically a connection issue. Yeah, it's a connection. Uh, I, I guess. Let me see. Uh, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, can you hear me now? I can. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I was. I was interested in the fact that uh, the the sutta talked about perception. A feeling, perception, and then proliferation, and there wasn't right. um, a, an identity about around the craving step. And I was just wanting a little bit more clarity around that. Around how perception then moves into um, uh, the proliferation, 
um, without the um, what would normally be present would be a, a craving, a description of craving being that link. So feeling, perception, and proliferation, or feeling, perception, yeah. and yeah, okay. But what happens with um, the perception? I mean, you know, now when you look into Dr. Punaji, the way he talks about perception, it's almost as if he's really a little upset that he that the Buddha didn't make perception a link. <laughs> but but perception, <laughs> perce yeah. I mean, I I had many talks with him. Like we don't want to we don't want to make perception a link. But perception is important because it's a function of the brain. But it's like a bl I call it a blink a blink um a a blink operation of the brain because it happens so fast you know so mm -hmm. if you you see hear smell taste or touch something per perception the perceiving is the naming of what it is that happens so you have contact all right and then the contact as conditioned feeling comes up and um you know, with contact, you 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 per the perception is where you perceive blue or red, like it was a blue vase, blue vase or something, you know, or a red rose. These things come from perception and they come from memory. There is a memory system in that. And, you know, there's an, if you might be able to find them over there in an antique shop, but I know over here, and well, in the United States, they have antique shops where you can find one of those heads like uh, they used a uh, probably Freud had one with all the parts written on the top of what the head does in the brain. <laughs> Turned out they're pretty right, pretty much right where it is. Um, but this memory is in there and it's telling you, te perceiving what is happening. And then you go forward from there with craving happening. And then the clinging, like you would like or dislike, the feeling was like, painful or pleasant and then you like or dislike it in craving that's where you are in craving and then it jumps into clinging and the clinging is if i like it it's like a flowing thing i like it i want it attachment and if it's i don't like it on the feeling then it's i don't like it i don't want it it's aversion goes in there but what the funny part of aversion is then you get attached to trying to make personally make the aversion stop. That's what happens. So you have, yeah. you know, you, you don't so like it and you don't want it, but you flip right away into an I have to stop this type of thing. Yeah. So the craving comes with the I like it, I don't like it. And the and the um clinging is why do you not like or dislike it? And the story bursts yeah. forth. And that's where the proliferation is born inside the clinging link. Okay, that's how it works. Okay. okay. But the the sutra itself went from feeling perception straight to proliferation. So I was interested in why why craving and clinging weren't possible. Well, okay. Are you talking about Madhu Pandika Sutta that I think was mentioned when I was teaching yes. this, right? And it's a yeah. fetch. They fetched it out of 18. So let's look at exactly what the phrase is so that you can understand precisely what, what that phrase was. Um, uh, let's see. So we do it, um, okay, dependent on the ear and sounds. Let's do the first one, all right. Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Now, what one feels, one perceives. Because yes. why? Yep. Because feeling, perception, and consciousness are the molecule. Remember the three-pointed yep. molecule yep. like this. It can't happen one without the other. What one perceives, one thinks about. Now that's your clinging, yes. okay? That is your clinging. Okay. Okay. Where, and the, the, craving? The, the craving happened very fast in there. The, with contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, one perceives. I like or dislike. And then what one perceives, one thinks about. And there's your ment their mental proliferation. So you had it. Okay. So is the perception yeah. is the perception there the I like it I don't like it. It's perceiving that liking or not liking. What one feels, 
that one perceives you perceive that you like you you perceive that you like or you dislike it oh, okay. Okay? okay and what yeah. one perceives that you like or dislike that one thinks about and thinks about is in place of clinging in this sutta thinks about what one thinks about is the is the clinging what one thinks about one mentally proliferates that's how it pushes it forward so it's a step okay. by okay. step Got it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> thank you very much, sister. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? We can dive into one more. Okay. Then maybe I need to let this go. And we'll say a prayer. It was a very nice time we had. Okay, I hope you learned a lot about the two characters. And next time is going to be interesting. I'll tell you what's coming next time real quick. After Anatta Pindika, now we go into Visaka. Visaka is a really good character. Visaka is terrific because Visaka did so much. And then we read about Jivaka. Jivaka was the, um, the doctor who took care of uh, the monks. And then after that, we start to do the kings. The different kings that were involved will come after that. So we've got a lot coming up here. There's a lot of characters in here. This is like, let's keep going and we'll know them all because it's a lot more fun when you listen to the suit and you hear these people are in there. Oh, wow, I remember him. <laughs> you remember who they are one at a time. Okay, so we'll say our prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Bentley.